history tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 111th episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast. Ghost tours for the theater of the mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Denise. And on this episode, we're going to be featuring the University of Montevallo. This was suggested to us by listener Lisa Atkinson, and she happens to be an alumni of that university. So she has some experiences to share with us, and we have the history and hauntings to share with you guys. There's a lot of activity going on at this university. Before we do that, we want to point you at our website, historyghostbump.com. And Denise, if people want to send us an email or some feedback, where can they do that? They can do that at historygoesbump at gmail.com. And we did get a couple of emails. The first one is from Kelsey Whitehead. Hello, ladies. I've been listening to your podcast for a few weeks now. It keeps me sane on my commute to work and sends me to sleep at night. I love the topics you guys cover. I've kind of just been cherry picking through episodes that I want to listen to and so far like them all. I love the one about Winchester Mystery House because I'm from the Bay Area. I would love to meet up with you guys when you come to the Bay Area. San Francisco is a must, and I think you guys would like Treasure Island because you get the best view of the city, and there's lots of cool, spooky-looking old military buildings. Keep up the great work. Oh, and to that one guy that said Denise has a terrible voice, I actually find it soothing. And no offense, Diane, but she's my favorite. But I love you, too. Thanks for the great podcast, and keep bringing us magic. Well, Kelsey, I'm not offended in the least. Denise is my favorite, too. Whitney Land sent us an email. I love your show, and I've been blowing through all of your episodes this past month. As someone who loves both history and ghost stories, I feel like it was made just for me. My favorite episode has been the Old Salem episode. My grandfather's from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and grew up on a tobacco farm with many brothers and sisters. I once got to see the house in about 1995 when we went back for a visit. They were just then installing indoor plumbing. I have photos of the giant tea kettle and have celebrated a few love feasts with my Moravian family. I only know a little about the Moravian religion, but your show had so many new facts, it was thrilling. If you ever get a chance to eat Moravian cookies, I suggest a black walnut from Mrs. Haynes Cookies, though the rest of my family prefers the classic ginger snap. Thank you again for doing what y'all do. I'd love to hear an episode about the Texas Hill Country. There are many sad and interesting stories from this area, like the Bandera Tragedy Tree. Thanks again, y'all. All right, well, we've taken that suggestion, Whitney, on both the cookies and the Texas Hill Country. Aston sent us an email. Hi, ladies. I just got done listening to your Felt Mansion episode and was so excited to hear about a location I actually have visited. I'm originally from Indiana and my family has vacationed every summer in Sagatuck for over 30 years. I didn't even know about the Felt Mansion until last summer when I saw it on a haunted Michigan list. My mother and I ended up visiting the mansion, but it was close for renovation, so we couldn't go inside. However, one of the first things my mom mentioned about the mansion was the Melonheads legend. I had never heard of the term, but she said it was a common derogatory term back in the day for hydrocephalus. Must be a Midwest thing. Wish I had a better explanation about it, but that's about all she knew. Anyway, keep up the good work, ladies, and I'm looking forward to the upcoming episode. So there we have somebody who is familiar with melon heads. We also heard from Joy Lucas on our fan page. I've lived in Michigan all my life, and this is the first I've heard of melon heads. Another creepy thought while hiking through the woods. No kidding. If you see any big-headed children, run for your lives. Julian Aguilera posted on our website, Love your show. I was told to you guys by Chobot at Bizarre States. Love the show. Hear you guys at work and on the way home. Love it. Thanks, Julian and Amy Martinez. Just listened to your Pythian episode and wanted to share that we also have a Pythian castle in my small hometown of Weatherford, Texas. It was built in 1909, and it's absolutely beautiful. I haven't heard of any hauntings, but they host an incredible haunted house every October. Well, that's definitely something to check out. And we want to thank the following people for their shout outs on Twitter, Real Rats Podcast and Lettuce Ketchup. Thanks so much to you guys. And also we heard from Jessica Chobot. She had listened to the Felt Mansion episode and she let us know that she had actually felt something watching her when she had visited the mansion back in 2004, 2005, when they were doing renovations there. So I told her, hmm, I wonder, is it the shadow people or was it melon heads? But now she knows there's definitely something there. So if you felt like you were being watched, you weren't wrong. And we want to welcome into the Spooktacular crew, Daisy. 
Hey, Daisy. And that's spelled D-A-Z-E-E. Pretty cool. Carol. Hey, Carol. Bianca. Hi, Bianca. Lori with an I. Hey, Lori with an I. Suzanne. Hey, Suzanne. Kristen. Hello, Kristen. Edward. Hi, Edward. Vicky with an I. Hey, Vicky with an I. Jessica Ann. Hello, Jessica Ann. Emily. Hello, Emily. Kimberly. Hey, Kimberly. And Tiana. And Tiana. Or as in princess. Tihana. <laughs> oh, oh, that's right. Tihana or Tiana. Denise, are you ready to go back to school? Well, not necessarily back to school, but I'd like to go visit the University of Montevallo. All right, here we go. Become an executive producer of the History Goes Bump podcast for as little as a buck a month. For $5 a month, you can access exclusive content like the Haunted True Crime bonus cast. And for $10 and above a month, you get all that plus awesome History Goes Bump gear. Check out patreon.com slash history goes bump for more information. Or you can give us a one-time donation by clicking the donate button at historygoesbump.com. History is full of oddities, curiosities, mysteries, and the truly bizarre. Welcome to This Moment in Oddity. Our Moment in Oddity is by Bob Sherfield. In 1947, 110 would-be Royal Marine Commandos embarked upon a nationwide five-day-long personal initiative test. Taking the initiative test was a very serious matter for the men. Passing out as a fully-fledged commando would depend upon it, but for the officers who designed and set the bizarre tasks, it was a lot more fun. On Thursday, May 8th, each man was given an individual task in order to reach their destinations, complete their task, and return with proof that they had done so on or before Tuesday, May 13th. To make things more difficult, the men weren't allowed to begin the test until the last train of the night had left the local station, Taiwan in Wales. None of the men had received any pay for nearly a fortnight, and they were not given any money. They were, however, issued with five days' worth of iron rations to sustain them. And so off they went into the darkness in groups of two or three to disperse across the country and attempt to complete their individual tasks. One of the men was assigned to spend the night in the Chamber of Horrors at Madame Tussauds. Getting to London with no money and in the middle of the night must have been a grueling task. Requesting free admission and an overnight stay at Tussauds would have been even more difficult. Spending the night with images of Dr. Crippen, Burke and Hare, Merritt, models of torture, etc. would definitely not be pleasant. Other men had to attempt tasks such as work at the face of a specified coal pit, secure 100 feet of film of himself at Denham Studios, get himself on any BBC broadcast, find out the population of three villages whose names are pronounced like who, why and when, find the smallest house in Britain, get a job as a bricklayer's laborer for four hours, Work as a corporation dustman for two hours in specified cities. Get a handkerchief dyed pink at Hinkley Dye Works, Lickashire, and get a photograph of the prettiest girl in the works. We're not sure if the man assigned to spend a night in the Chamber of Horrors at Madame Tussauds was successful, but we certainly would not want that task. A wax museum at night with famous horror scenes? Being assigned the task to spend the night in Madame Tussauds as a personal initiative test? Certainly is odd. You're not afraid of a little ghost, are you? This Day in History This Day in History is brought to us by Stephen Pappas. On this day, March 10th in 1876... Alexander Graham Bell made the first successful call with a telephone. In the 1870s, telegraph use was increasing rapidly. Western Union President William Orton even called it the nervous system of commerce. Bell went to the head of the Smithsonian in 1875 and said he was considering a multi-tone telegraph device that he hoped would one day have the capability of transmitting the human voice. The Smithsonian head said he loved the idea, and when Bell protested, saying he did not have the knowledge to create such a device, the man told him simply, in regards to the knowledge, get it. 
This inspired Bell, and after teaming with Thomas A. Watson, an experienced electrical engineer and mechanic, the two began work on what they referred to as an acoustic telegraph. This would eventually be patented, and the men would create the first working telephone. The first successful message was sent to the other room simply stating, Mr. Watson, come here, I want to see you. History Goes Bump Podcast. The University of Montevallo in Alabama has roots back to the Civil War and even back beyond that time period. The college started off as an all-girls school using many antebellum buildings in town to serve as campus buildings. It was an educational experiment that worked and eventually led one day to the college becoming a co-ed institution. Its success continues to this day. The campus is part of a historic district and has seen quite a few tragedies in its time. Massacres, horrific deaths, and war have led to unrest in the afterlife. It would seem that the university is quite haunted. Join us as we explore the history and hauntings of the University of Montevallo. The town of Montevallo in Alabama had once been the home to the Creek tribe. Jesse Wilson moved to the area and bought some land up on a hill in 1814. The area would come to be known as Wilson's Hill. Once he was established, he invited friends and family to follow him. The settlement later changed its name to Montevallo, which is Italian and means the hill in the valley. The city was incorporated in 1848 and began to flourish with the building of a rail line to Selma and a coal mine. Wealthy businessman Edmund King brought his wife and son to Montevallo in the 1820s. He built a mansion up on the hill and called it Mansion House. That's really creative. creative. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to build a house and call it House. <laughs> <laughs> it would later come to be known as the King House. The King family lived peacefully with the Creek tribe that was in the area, and the mansion was considered one of the most beautiful homes in the state. The Civil War later came through Montevallo, and a Confederate hospital was set up in a large building that would later become Reynolds Hall. The Confederate soldiers built underground tunnels to allow themselves safe passage. One of the legends from the Civil War was that Sherman's forces came through and destroyed the nearby Briarfield Iron Works and then stopped in at the Confederate hospital and killed all the sick and wounded men there. The victims were buried in King's Cemetery. In the 1890s, the residents of Montevallo set their sights on having a college, and they put a bid in to become the location of the Alabama Girls Industrial School. This was going to be a white women's technical school. The city of Montevallo won. The college was founded in 1896. It would be a great thing for the area to have the college here, and it would eventually be the main source of revenue, pushing out the coal mining industry. You may recall the name of the Olmsted Brothers architectural firm from our Biltmore episode. They designed the grounds there, and they also designed Central Park in New York. The Olmsted Brothers designed the campus in Montevallo. It's important to note that many antebellum buildings were already at the site, and they were just adopted into use at the college. For this reason, several design styles are seen, ranging from Greek Revival to Colonial Revival to Federal. Two of the main buildings are King House and Reynolds Hall. The campus covers nearly 26 acres. When the college first opened, it was innovative in that it made it a goal to teach women to be self-supporting. The first class of women had 150 in their number. They learned bookkeeping, art, music, sewing, and how to work the telegraph, and many were trained to become teachers themselves. Captain Henry Clay Reynolds was the first president of the school. He championed the school coming to Montevallo. Reynolds Hall was named for him. The good captain had set up an interesting tuition payment plan. His plan was that the students pay their tuition directly to him and he invests the money into furnishings for his home and other personal expenses. Let's just say that the Reynolds name has lasted longer than the captain lasted as president of the college. Yeah, apparently you're not supposed to pay the president your tuition when you go to university. Well, I was about to say hot. Diggity, let's open a university. (laughs) (laughs) No kidding. 
In 1911, the college changed its name to the Alabama Girls Technical Institute and then added and College for Women in 1919. As the curriculum continued to round out over the years, it became apparent that it was more than just a technical school, and the name was changed again in 1923 to Alabama College, State College for Women. In 1956, it was decided to make the college co-educational, and the College for Women portion of the title was dropped, and men began to attend the college. On September 1, 1969, the college came to be known as the University of Montevallo. Because of the age of many of the buildings, the campus became a National Historic District and was added to the National Register of Historic Places. There are currently 73 campus buildings and eight residence halls and one cemetery right smack dab in the middle of everything. That's very unique on a college campus. Definitely. It's no surprise with the age of some of the buildings on campus that there are some tales of ghost sightings. One of the most popular stories is about a girl named Condi Cunningham. Condi was born in Alabama in 1891. She decided to attend the Alabama Girls Industrial School, and she moved into a fourth-floor dorm room in Main Hall, the largest woman's dorm. She accidentally caught her nightgown on fire with a chafing dish. What could have been a quick fix by drop and rolling to smother the flames turned into a tragedy when Condi took off running down the hall and screaming for help. She was terribly burned and later died. Everyone who stayed in her former room since then has demanded to be moved immediately due to strange occurrences. The room is no longer assigned and there is a locked metal door on the room. Each hall director has passed down the tale of seeing the image of a woman screaming in the wood grain, even after replacing it multiple times. The last wooden door removed from the room is still there in the storage room and they let people check it out up close. The image of a screaming woman seems to have its hair on fire. A full-bodied apparition engulfed in flames has been witnessed running in the hallways. Disembodied screams are heard, as are the disembodied sounds of running feet. Doors and windows open and close on their own. Here is the story as it appeared in the Birmingham Age Herald on February 7, 1908. Miss Condi Cunningham died last night at 10 o'clock at the Girls Industrial School in Montevallo from the burn she received last Tuesday night by her clothing catching on fire from an alcohol lamp. Miss Cunningham is the daughter of W.C. Cunningham, clerk of the Inferior Court, and her parents were at her bedside in the dormitory when death came. The remains will arrive in Birmingham over the Louisville and Nashville Railroad at noon today, being carried by private conveyance from Montevallo to Solera. No funeral arrangements have yet been made, but the funeral will probably be tomorrow morning. The body will be accompanied to Birmingham by an escort of the faculty. The fatal accident has cast a gloom over the entire school at Montevallo, where Miss Cunningham was held in high esteem by her classmates. She was just 17 years of age and had been a student at the school for the past two years. On Tuesday night, Miss Cunningham and her roommate were busy with a chafing dish in their room in the dormitory, and while trying to extinguish the flames of the alcohol lamp, her clothing caught on fire. She rushed into the hall where the flames were soon put out by her schoolmates, but not before she'd been badly burned. Her parents in Birmingham were immediately notified of the accident and went to Montevallo on the next train. Doctors worked hard, but their efforts were of no avail, and after 48 hours of suffering, the beloved student succumbed to her injuries. Her listener, Lisa, shared the following personal experiences that she had. I lived on the third floor of Main Hall, in the back of the center hall. It had an east, west, and central hall, each branching from the main lobby, like the letter E. And one day I walked to the front of the hall so I could descend the grand staircase. As I reached the staircase, I heard very loud footsteps stomping over my head, running toward the back of the fourth floor hall above me. I was concerned something was wrong. I ran upstairs but saw nothing. No one went into the dorm room because you can hear the old heavy wood door echoes when opened and closed. I even went to see if someone was in the bathroom. There was no one. On another day, I was leaving for class, and as I walked by the ladies' bathroom, I heard the squeak of an old metal shower knob turn on. I remember this reminded me to go ahead and use the restroom before my very long class. I went into the bathroom, but did not hear the usual sounds of someone taking a shower. No splashing or singing like some girls did. The entire bathroom was empty. Every stall. 
One shower stall had the hot water spraying full blast, and I burned my hand turning it off. But I heard the shower turn on from just outside the door. So it makes you wonder who turned that water on. Well, especially if she went in right as she heard it and nobody was there. Exactly. So there's no way that somebody turned it on and then ran out. They would have run into her. Plus, who does that? You know, nobody turns on water full blast and then runs out of the room. This is the main hall where this Condi Cunningham lost her life. And it's just interesting to hear that somebody was running around above her head on the fourth floor. And that's the floor that Condi died on or that Condi had lived on when she caught on fire. Makes you wonder, is that who she heard running down the hallway? Very possibly. And is that who's turning on the water in the bathroom? That's possible as well. Because who knows if she ran down trying to douse her flames. You know, they didn't really go into detail on that. So There is another possibility in Main Hall, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Reynolds Hall is now the theater building, and as is the case with so many theaters, this one is haunted. Captain Reynolds is thought to be one of the ghosts. The story behind his haunting goes back to the massacre that happened in this building when it was a Confederate hospital. Captain Reynolds had been given the duty of security for the hospital. But when he heard the nearby ironworks was under attack, he took his men from the hospital to go defend the ironworks. When they returned, they found everyone massacred. The captain vowed that day to never leave the hospital unguarded, and many believe that is what he's doing in the afterlife. Of course, that is only if the massacre actually happened, and it may not have. As we mentioned earlier, this is a legend that goes with the Civil War. There's not really any evidence to prove that an actual massacre did happen. And if there was one, there weren't a whole lot of these Confederate soldiers that were buried in the cemetery that's there at King Cemetery. So it wasn't a very big massacre if that was the case. And although I know things got bad during the war, and as we know, Sherman burned whole cities, I just find it hard to believe that he would go into a hospital and massacre a bunch of sick or dying men. So we don't know that that actually happened, but there could be another reason why Reynolds is here, and maybe that's because he's bitter about being fired as president of the college. Doors and windows shut and open on their own at this building. The blue glowing specter of Captain Reynolds has been seen on various occasions. Reynolds' picture was hanging in the lobby for many years and was finally removed and replaced with another painting. Staff came in the following day to see the new painting on the floor replaced by Reynolds' portrait. So somebody was moving pictures around. Hmm, I wonder who that was. The King Cemetery is right in the middle of campus. The King family is buried there along with Confederate soldiers. It is thought that a young male member of the King family was killed in an accidental shooting and is buried in the cemetery. Condi is not the only ghost in Main Hall. A young woman committed suicide in the dorm and her apparition is sometimes seen. So this could be who Lisa heard as well, or who could have been turning on the water. Oh, exactly. So one, maybe one doing one and one doing the other. Palmer Hall has an auditorium, organ, and stage area. One of its designers was named W.H. Trumbauer. His name was left off the cornerstone, and perhaps that is why his ghost haunts this building. His ghost has been seen wandering around backstage. He also likes to judge the student-created plays that are put on during the week of homecoming. During final dress rehearsal, students claim he swings the battens over the performance of his pick. A batten is a horizontal pole from which curtains or lights can be hung. A student was once practicing the organ alone in the building. She played for a while and then decided it was time to head home. When she stopped playing, she heard a disembodied voice ask her to continue to play. That would be a surefire way to get me not to play anymore (laughs) because I would be so out of there. I could just imagine if you've been playing this organ, you're really into it, and then you finish up and you hear this voice and you turn around expecting to see a janitor or something and there's nobody there. Oh, no. That's when Diane would get her depends out again. (laughs) Exactly. Hanson Hall is a female residence dorm and is apparently haunted. The ghost is believed to have belonged to a dedicated house mother who stayed on in the afterlife to look after the girls. Women who stay up late studying complain about feeling as though they are being watched. One young woman claimed her mug disappeared while she was studying. She looked everywhere for it but could not find it. A few weeks later, the mug showed up again in the same spot from where it had disappeared. 
The King House is used for special occasions on the campus, and a former maid there does not like having guests in the home that she once cared for. Edmund King buried his gold outside the house to hide it from the Union, and people now claim to see the ghost of an elderly man carrying a lantern and a shovel walking around outside of the house, more than likely looking for his gold. One night, some students claimed to see a lantern moving from window to window on the second floor when there was no one in the building. On another occasion, students saw an elderly man who was transparent waving to them from a second-story window. Cold spots are felt throughout the house. What's interesting about this ghost is that they think he's looking for his gold, but I would assume that once the union was out of this area, he would have gone back out and dug up his gold. I don't think he would have just left it buried. And the other interesting thing is there's now a residence hall or might be an academic building where supposedly he had buried the gold before. So it's definitely not here because you know darn well that if he had left the gold buried and a construction crew came through and dug it up, uh, yeah, they'd have it now. Exactly. And instead of a lady in white at this location, there is a lady of the rock. This one's new for us. Yeah, we've never had a lady of the rock. We've had lavender... White, blue. Near King House is a painted rock called Sigma Rock. Fraternities have a tradition of painting the rock. A woman dressed in yellow is seen sometimes sitting on the rock. She's there one minute, gone the next. At other times, she's seen wandering around the rock. No one knows why she's there, but students have been telling the story that she is heartbroken and looking for her lost love. So I don't know what the attachment is to this rock, but apparently it has something to do with her lost love. Lupe writes of her experiences on the campus, quote, My boyfriend heard someone tell him to get out when he and his friend, along with the baseball team, snuck into King's house late at night, ironically during Halloween. I've heard Condi's hollow, hair-raising scream at 4.45 a.m. one Wednesday night in December. I've seen a woman in the corner of my room in a Civil War-era dress, seemingly chastising me for having snuck my boyfriend into my dorm room late at night to sleep. And then there's King's House Kitchen, who anyone who's paid any attention to it has gotten a bad vibe from that place. And more than a handful of people have told me they've also felt watched whenever they've gone near there. End quote. So lots of ghosts watching is the feeling that I'm getting from all of these different haunting experiences. Just lots of watching going on. Yeah, just, you know, maybe even trying to figure out why all the people are there, why there's boys at the college now. No. That's what's really interesting, how she mentioned that she was getting chastised for having her boyfriend in her dorm room. If you think that this dates back to that time, to an earlier time, it would be like, what in the world are all these boys doing around here? Well, sort of like when we were watching um, Agent Carter and anybody who had a boy in, like you would have instant dismissal. So it was very not heard of back in the day. Exactly. And so interesting that King's house sounds incredibly haunted. Yeah, so one of these days we're heading Alabama way. We'll have to maybe stop by. That's the interesting thing. You know, when you hear, oh, there's some ghosts at a university, it really is amazing how many different buildings on a university campus can be haunted, and they're all different kinds of ghosts. So the university is a place open and welcoming to everyone now. Is it open to more than just the living? Do the ghosts of Confederate soldiers and former students roam the campus? Is the University of Montevallo haunted? That is for you to decide. I don't know. There's enough experiences, not to mention that we had our listener who suggested this location had her own experiences, which I would trust. So I would say this place sounds like it's got something going on there. Absolutely. Lots of something going on there. On our next episode, we are going to be going down under. Back to Australia. And back to jail. <laughs> they have lots of jails down there. We're going to go to the Fremantle Jail. Very cool. This one was suggested by our listener, Jenny Lee Watt, who also happens to be a tour guide. So we're going to get the expert perspective on this location. Yes, we are. So I'm looking forward to bringing that to everybody. We just want to remind everybody that we do have quite a few events coming up. So in April, we'll be heading into Colorado and we're planning on doing a haunted pub crawl. So please let us know if you're interested in that. And again, this will be April of 2016. So that's either going to be the 15th or 17th. We're just waiting to see who's interested in going before we set that date. I'm thinking probably the Friday night. And then 
Also coming up in April, on the 23rd of April, 2016, we're going to be revisiting the St. Augustine Lighthouse for the Dark of the Moon Ghost Tour. So anybody local or from outside that will be visiting Florida during that time, we'd love to have you join us. And then coming up in June on the weekend of the 24th, 25th, and 26th, we will be in Alton, Illinois at the Haunted America Conference. That first night on the 24th, we are also going to be doing a ghost tour on our own in St. Charles, Missouri. Not on our own, but aside from the conference, we're, we're doing the the ghost of um, St. Charles tour. So please let us know if you'd like to join us for any or all of the above. We'd love to meet you. And we have a couple of reviews to share with everyone. First up, five stars from Oregon Red Rose. Love this podcast. Fun and informative show. Spooky with just the right amount of history. The hosts are fantastic. I definitely feel they are just the type of ladies I'd be friends with. Give it a listen. Thanks, Oregon. We appreciate that. Automated Joy, five stars. Loving my spooky history aunties. Diane and Denise are your cheerful hosts for this creepy history podcast. Every week they select a new potentially haunted location and listeners learn how and why its history went bump in the dark. Thanks so much for that, Automated Joy. And Susie is Q. Five Star, a perfect mix of history and the supernatural. When I first saw this podcast, I was a bit hesitant at listening to this, fearing that it would be too childish like many podcasts, but I'm so glad that I gave this podcast a listen. The two hosts are funny and charming. This podcast is fun and informative. For all fans of history and the supernatural, this is the perfect podcast for you. Well, thank you, Susie. We appreciate that. We want to thank you guys for joining us for this episode. I have been your host, Diane. And this has been Denise. You take care now. Bye-bye. This episode has been brought to us by our executive producers. Welcome to new executive producer, Sarah Thylan. Thank you. Hey, this is Christopher. And this is Joe. From the Curioso Podcast. And here at the Curioso, when we want to listen to ghost tours for the theater of the mind... We listen to the History Goes Bump podcast. Societies rise and societies fall. When the time comes, one society steps forward to build a better future. The Wicked Library, Kettle and Whistle Radio, Night Story Podcast, Prog Watch, Red Horse Radio, The Lift, History Goes Bump, Listen, The M Writing Podcast, Society 13, Rebuilding Society, one podcast at a time.